Hello, I'm Rico Cavellia. Welcome to Fearless Aging, where in every episode, my guests and I, we strive to offer you proven tips and strategies that you can use immediately to greatly improve your overall health and well-being. So we're here to inspire you and empower you to become your best self so you can go out and make a bigger positive difference in the world. And so the title of today's ep episode, I'm really excited about because this is something that I've been promoting for years. So the title is Bridging the Gap Between Lifespan and Healthspan. And we have a great expert guest with us today. His name is Dr. Mahmoud Khan. He has a, a distinguished career, has included several senior corporate roles, including Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer of Global Research and Development at PepsiCo, and also at, at, at President of Global R&D at Takeda, Takeda Pharmaceuticals. And before moving into the private sector, Dr. Khan was a faculty member at endocrinology at Mayo Clinic and Medical School, where he served as director of diabetes endocrine nutritional trials unit. He has also led programs in diabetes, endocrinology, metabolism, and nutrition in Minneapolis. So Dr. Khan, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. You know, again, I'm so excited because this is something such an important message. And, it, and the, as, you, as we, well, as, as, our, as our audience is going to find out, there's a big gap between lifespan and health span. So this is such an important topic. So I, I think maybe my first question for you then is how did you be, first become interested in, 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 in working on the difference between health span and lifespan? Well, look, as you mentioned, most of my clinical career was in the field of endocrinology and specifically within it, diabetes. Mm -hmm. And diabetes is one of those, unfortunately, very common diseases that causes and results, if not well managed, in accelerated aging. Why do I say that? Patients with diabetes very commonly get heart disease at an earlier age than patients without diabetes. They get nerve and brain damage. They have a higher risk of dementia. They have a high risk of some cancers that are also age-related. And so several, including those, are examples. So as a clinician, treating patients with diabetes, I was seeing this firsthand from my practice career. And then during my pharmaceutical uh, career, was involved in helping develop and lead programs in the development of treatments for diabetes to slow the, the process underlying diabetes. So this is something I've been as a practitioner interested in all my career, unfortunately, usually dealing with the end consequences of aging as, a, as opposed to keeping those from happening and therefore really maintaining health span versus trying to extend life and how patients could live with the consequences of aging once they've occurred. Two very different things. Yeah, very different. So I think we, we probably should first even uh, define what we mean by health span. I'll, I'll say what I think, and then you say why, how you define it. But, but health span is really how long you can stay healthy and active and functional when you're alive. So it's it's a great it's a it's a great perspective that you've mentioned. Fully agree with what you're saying. Let me just build on it a little bit. Yes, we please. know that our life expectancy as a population over the last hundred years has almost doubled. We've gained about thirty some years of life expectancy mostly through public health approaches, right? Clean water, clean food, eliminating uh, diseases related to the environment, in particular microbiological examples, right? So we did a great job. Now we can live longer, but as we've lived longer, the last 10 to 20 years of our life has been now burdened with one, two, three, and sometimes several diseases which come on later in life, which are age related. That difference calculated or defined medically could be disease-free periods or time of our life. Another way to think about it is a functional, which is much more how we think as people. How long can I remain independent? Which is I can walk on my own, I can uh, travel, I can um, take care of myself and think and be physically active in an independent manner. That is how most of us will think about as healthy, our healthy life. I'll add one more thing which is not talked about, which we are really starting to understand much better. 
And that is how resilient we are. Very few people and very little in the literature has talked about this. If you actually start to understand, the difference between getting old and being young is not that you won't get a viral infection, you won't get COVID, you won't get the flu, you won't get an injury. Any of us who've lived long enough have experienced that. But when you're young and resilient, you recover like that. It's a bit like, you know, you, you got an injury on a Saturday morning playing football and soccer by Monday morning, you bugged it off. That's when you're 20. Yeah. Why yeah. when you're 50? And now the aches and pains go on for a week. And when you're 60 and 70, it takes longer to recover from the same thing. What did COVID teach us? The vast majority of deaths from COVID were in people over the age of 60. They were less resilient. And so resilience mentally, resilient physically, is a very important attribute to maintain. And that is health span versus life span. As we get older and longer, our resilience declines. But when we have healthy period of life, we're actually far more resilient. And one of the things that medical science has not yet been able to understand is how to accurately measure resilience and importantly, how to maintain it, which then leads to a biological concept that we are very interested in, which is called intrinsic capacity. The more your intrinsic capacity, the more resilient you are. And we can get into all aspects of that, but I just yeah, wanted to yeah. throw that yeah. out there for a conversation. Yeah, that was well stated. Thank you very much. I, I just want to add, even if you're disease-free, but still so many people are, are suffering with all these chronic illnesses, you know, chronic things that are really just lifestyle, uh, are, are caused by lifestyle. And, and, and so, so we need to learn how that we can change. If we create a healthier lifestyle, we can create a much, uh, a much longer health span as well. Totally agree with you. Smoking, physical yeah. activity, diet, sleep, stress. All of these are lifestyle related, which become cumulative in their impact on our health span. Yeah, definitely. So also, let's talk a little bit about lifespan. Uh, the last thing that, that I've, I, I've, real, I've, I've learned is that, you know, science now tells us that our, our lifespan, our, our genetic potential is to stay healthy to at least 125. But yet we know our lifespan, especially in America, is actually coming down. It's, it's only about 77 in America. So talk a little bit about lifespan. Yeah, so as, as, as you stated, if we go back to the year 1900, whether you look at US or Western Europe, UK, lifespan was probably, you know, somewhere in the 40s. That was the lifespan. Today, it's between 75 and 85, depending on the country you look at. And you're right, the US is not the country with the greatest lifespan. Con countries like uh, Japan, Northern Europe, uh, some parts of Italy are have much greater life expectancies. Why is that? Partly lifestyle, partly genetics, the environment they live in. But remember, we in the US, unfortunately, have, two, have recently seen a decline, mostly related to two factors. One is trauma and violence, and the second is drug-related deaths. Yeah. And those have resulted in premature loss of life across many parts of the United States, which have brought our life expectancy down. Add on to that an increasing prevalence of obesity and diseases related to obesity, such as diabetes, heart disease, and some cancers. So these are all contributing to a decline in our life expectancy, unfortunately. So it's affecting quality of life, but also the duration of our life. Yeah, again, so well stated. And I'm really glad you, you brought up that point about gun violence and, and, and all those things and all the stress. That's a big factor that not enough people are talking about, it, you know, that, how that really affects our, our health and our lifespan. But also, I, I want to talk a little bit more about what you mentioned about the, about the quality of life. So, 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 obviously, we want to be healthy and we want to, everybody wants to be healthy and live as long as they can. But talk about why, other, other than the fact that, you know, for your own personal benefit, but what are some other aspects of why we should be living longer and, and why, why we shouldn't want to be healthier and live longer? Well, look, let's, um, I distinguish very clearly as we started this conversation between living longer for the sake of living longer versus living healthier as long as possible. 
two different things. Most people we've surveyed around the world don't want to live longer just for the sake of living longer, especially if it means they're spending 10 years right. dependent on care of loved ones, family, relatives, friends, or institutions. Nobody wants that. People want to be independent. Now, why should we care about living healthy as long as possible? That's, to me, the question. Mm -hmm. Well, there are many reasons. First of all, as an individual, it means we can remain not only independent, but productive. Productive isn't just working, going to work every day. Productive can be taking care of your grandchildren because you want to. Participating in your society, in your church, in your mosque, in your whichever temple that you believe in, you're part of a community in doing that. That is very much part of being productive. Okay, So rather than receiving, you're actually giving and continue to give as long as possible. So that's an individual benefit of living healthy as long as possible. Yeah, the second, yeah. of course, is like not living, not living with pain and disease, which comes from being unhealthy, right? This, so that's the individual level. At the society level, city, town, family, it actually is, it, it takes other individuals who could be contributing to uh, our lives in other ways who are now diverted to take care of you. So let me give you an example. It's well studied now that two thirds of the people who take care of an elderly person, family member, a loved one, are women. So those younger women who are taking care of a parent or an in-law often have to give up a career, have to stop career development, have to give up other means of income. So it's a double whammy. They're actually taken away from things that they would want to do and are having to take care of a loved one, not that because they don't love them, but this becomes an added burden onto a family unit. And that itself is a reason that we should stay as healthy and independent as long as possible. Now, let's take a look at the UK or the US. If you think about Medicare, you think about the UK National Health Service. Everybody knows no longer can, in a pay-forward society, we continue to be able to take care of a growing larger number of older people in the model we have today. The disease burden is too high. The numbers are growing. The NHS is no longer affordable. Medicare is no longer affordable. And yet, it's been shown clearly with research that for, if we were to extend just a healthy part of our life by 12 months, the GDP impact is $4 trillion in not only cost savings, but productivity. So at a national level, governments should care. They may think they care, but they're not taking the actions of what it will take to reap those benefits if we actually rethought of how to keep our population healthy. Well, wow. again, so well said. Thank you so much. I just want to add to that. You know, it's, it's my belief, you know, that, you know, as we age, uh, we gain knowledge and we gain wisdom, right? And, and, and as you know very well, we as humanity are facing so many monumental challenges these days. And so I, I think, you know, we need more people as they age to stay healthy and energetic so they can give back their knowledge to help solve these problems. And then also, we need more people to be mentors and role models for younger people, which we're sorely lacking these days. As we said, because most people, uh, first of all, they're not even living long enough, but, and then they don't have a really good uh, a health span. So we need, we need people to stay healthy so they can make a bigger contribution to the world. So be, look, this is, you've raised a great point, Rico. I, you know, I'm a scientist, so I always look for where's the evidence. So let me give you a couple of pieces. Uh, a German automotive company did an experiment on their production line. And on one production line, they put all young, strong, healthy individuals who were on the production line and they measured productivity. And then they actually did another experiment at the same time where they mixed experienced, older, more wise production workers with the young workers. And then the third one was all the older, all the experienced workers on one production line. The most productive line turned out to be the mixture. 
and they leverage the strength and energy, all of the things of young people, coupled with the wisdom and problem solving and emotional intelligence of the older and the most productive line when you mix the both. That was eye opening. So and so there's other pieces of evidence of what you're actually saying, not only makes sense, but when you do it, it works. Now the question, how do you create a work environment where older people like you and I can in fact be yeah. part of the team, part of the discourse where each leverages the other. This isn't just good for the older person, it's actually good for the younger person in both, both benefits. Absolutely, that's so good. I really appreciate that. Okay, we're gonna take a short uh, one minute break and when we come back, uh, Dr. Khan's gonna talk about his new Global Health Span Summit that's coming up in 2025. So, so stay tuned, we'll be right back in one minute here. Hello, I'm Rico Cavellia, creator of the Ageless Living Lifestyle. If you are concerned about premature aging and you want to avoid disease and old age, and you want to live a more healthy, energetic, and vital long life, I have proven solutions for you. So number one, go to agelesslivinglifestyle.com and take our aging quiz to see how well you are doing. And number two, book your free coaching session with me to discuss your wellness challenges, and I promise to get you going on the right track. You can transform your health and your life, and I can help. Okay, we are back with Dr. Khan, and we're going to talk about the Global Health Span Summit that's coming up in 2025. First of all, I want to ask you, Dr. Khan, uh, what is the Hevolution Foundation? And what does that mean, Hevolution, as opposed to Revolution? <laughs> so Hevolution is, is a combination of health and evolution. Oh, we cool. think about how we've thought about health, to think about the next phase of how we as individuals, practitioners, and society, all components of society, think about that next evolution of our health. And that's the connection to health span. And the Evolution Foundation was created, uh, conceived approximately six years ago as an idea uh, through the a royal decree where we were created to extend healthy human lifespan and promoting that through investing both in science by accelerating the progress of the science and allowing solutions to come to market, by investing capital to help in that process, by funding more scientists and new projects to attract new minds, as well as funding existing scientists to grow the pie of the people in putting their best thoughts into this problem to solve and ultimately to create awareness uh, around the world, not only of this challenge, but the exciting opportunity. So we like to think of ourselves as a catalyst for this field. We think of ourselves as a convener for this field in terms of bringing diverse perspectives to the table, which is where Global Health Span Summit came about. And today we have at Health Evolution uh, as an organization, we're funding over 200 scientists around the world and their research in over 150 labs. We are funding uh, and investing. We've already invested in our sixth company and we've held the largest gathering of diverse perspectives coming in to for two days in Riyadh last year to come and share their ideas and look for solutions coming. That was last year. Next year, we wanna follow that on. And by the way, when we held the Global Health Span Summit last year, we thought we'd get about 500 people coming because the largest meeting in this space, it's a small field, was less than 500 people. Yeah. We had to shut registration at 2,000 people. <laughs> That's we, not good. Could not, we could not physically accommodate anymore. Now we had many, many more uh, dialing in virtually, but people wanted to come and they came from all over the world, from the east, the south, the north and the west. So we, we laugh because we're the Middle East and we held it in the Middle East. And we brought everybody together from every discipline, scientists, investors, regulators, policymakers, 
bioethicists, small and big pharma, all actually participate. It's the first time that will happen at that scale anywhere. 2025, we're following on, sharing the latest developments, sharing the work of all these scientists that we have around the world that are funded by government, philanthropy, including by evolution. And then looking to what's the future look like? How do we work together to take on probably one of the greatest challenges that mankind faces right now? Yeah, that's, that's so good. Yeah, one of the things I like, to, one of my signature talks, I like to say, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that we are facing as humanity is becoming old and sick and dying way too young. So you guys are doing some great work. It's such good news to hear that so many people are interested in it. You're doing some great work. So tell us a little bit more about what's, what are some of the topics that you're going to be covering at the, at the summit? Well, it's um, we're still six months away from the summit and uh, I, I, my team, and really the credit goes to my organization. I get the privilege of doing sharing their work. Uh, and it is truly something, a privilege that I remind myself, because there is such an amazing team. And one of the teams is working on HealthSpan uh, uh, you know, with the communications and project management team is this summit. And if we think about it, and by the way, 50% of the speaking slots are already confirmed and we're six months away. And so uh, anything like last year, we'll have more people requesting to become part of this than we have spot, which you know, we can handle. But what are the main, some of the themes? Think of them in the areas that we're interested in. Where are the scientific breakthroughs happening? Sorry. Excuse me. Where are the scientific breakthroughs happening? What are the um, exciting future directions of this science? And we'll have sessions around that. What are the investable opportunities for people with public and private capital that want to take that science from universities as great science and ideas, but actually put it in the hands of and clinicians? And then ultimately, what are the policy changes that need to happen to enable all this to happen? Now, one of the things that we also did on top of all of this, and we did this right at the start, is something that is also underrepresented in the conversations, which is, what about bioethics? We've talked about the exciting opportunities, but our mission is very clear. We want to extend healthy human lifespan for the benefit of all. Let me unpack that. Healthy lifespan, not just lifespan. We've talked about that already, but also for the benefit of all. So how do you take this exciting science and democratize it in a way that it teach, touches as many lives as possible, made available and accessible, regardless of who you are. That includes many aspects of bioethics. Not only what is the science we're doing, but should we do it? And that shouldn't be decided just by scientists. I think society has the critical voice in determining what is acceptable as science. And ultimately, is it scalable so that it's ethically and physically, financially going to be possible for everybody or as much as possible for people to benefit. And the last topic on that is, what will it take to scale? Who are the players that will need to do that? And that's where government and regulators are very important. That's what Global Health Span Summit is about, bringing these different topics, perspectives together, and not only just talking, but coming out with action plans. I'll give you an example. Last Health Span Summit, we announced the XPRIZE. And the HealthSpan, we are the largest sponsor of the aging HealthSpan prize. It's over $100 million in prize money. And the goal is to address three human organ systems in order to demonstrate muscle and bone, immune system, and neurological system, and show you can actually slow and reverse the aging process in humans. Whichever team, regardless where we are in the world, wins, the first price is over $80 million. That's, That's a okay. lot of incentive. Yeah. And several hundred teams from all the, around the world have already pre-registered. That's an example of actions that we announced 
Last forgot, time. We've only got yeah. a, less than a minute left. So we'll actually put in the, in, in the description from the show how people can access your summit. So we don't have to say that. We'll, we'll give them that information, how they could access your summit. I just wanted to if, just take a, we've only got about less than a minute to go. What would you say if you, if you gave somebody just your number one tip or strategy that, that they can implement immediately to improve their health span? What would you say that was? Create balance in your life. Perfect. Balance in your diet, balance in your activity, balance in your relationships, balance in your wake sleep. Balance is probably the best known contributor that we have today. And included in that is balance in your nutrients, macronutrients and micronutrients, including the right vitamins, supplements, all of those things in that balance. Dr. Khan, awesome. thank you so, so very much. Thank you so very much. We're out of time. That was, I was great. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me.